Hey guys, what's up? It's Alec Torelli and welcome back to Cryptorelli, where my mission is to simplify the crypto space for anyone to understand. Thanks for being here and I appreciate your support as we cross the 3000 subscriber mark. If you haven't already, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications for daily videos and join the conversation on my Twitter, Discord and Telegram, all links in the description. Today I'm asking for your help. I got invited to give two keynotes in February to help newcomers navigate the crypto space. So this is what I put together. My ego doesn't need consoling, so please leave your brutally honest, constructive criticism in a comment so I can make this talk as impactful as possible. And now I present to you my keynote, everything there is divided by 21 million. In 2009, Simon Sinek gave one of the most viewed TED Talks of all time called Start With Why. In it, he talked about how great leaders inspire action by sharing a vision for why they do what they do instead of focusing on the what. It seemed to work for him, as the talk has more than 60 million combined views on TED and YouTube, so I'm not going to reinvent the wheel, and instead I'll start at the beginning with why cryptocurrency exists in the first place and what problem it's aiming to solve. I believe that without this fundamental understanding, nothing else will make sense and one cannot fully navigate the crypto space. But first, a disclaimer. Nothing I'm saying is intended to be financial advice, but for educational purposes only. The ideas I'm about to share are the summary of my deeply held opinions after spending thousands of hours researching crypto, finance, economics, game theory, and the history of money, which I wrote about in my series on my website, alectorelli.com, and produced on my YouTube called The Future of Money. That said, I wouldn't be objective without telling you I don't have a degree in economics, nor one in finance, and many people will disagree with my conclusions. If poker has taught me anything, it's that I'm often wrong, and I may be here as well. Also, nothing I'm sharing with you in this talk is really original. I didn't invent these ideas right down to the title, which is in fact a popular meme in the Bitcoin community, but my skill lies in connecting the dots and simplifying things in a way that anyone can understand. Bitcoin and money are quite a deep rabbit hole, so let's see if I can live up to the challenge. By now you may be familiar with the origin story of crypto, so I'll keep it brief. On October 31st, 2008, a computer programmer by the pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto released a white paper for a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system called Bitcoin. Nakamoto implemented the Bitcoin software as open source code and released it on January 3rd, 2009. What many people don't know is the message that was embedded into the blockchain itself. Quote, the Times, January 3rd, 2009, Chancellor on the brink of second bailouts for banks. It was the middle of a global financial crisis, and the stability of our current financial system was in question. This is a dense statement, and I can see how on the offset, Bitcoin and crypto are confusing and overwhelming, but really the idea is quite simple. So I'm going to attempt to explain things using what are called first principles, meaning reducing things down to their absolute essence. From this standpoint, one beginning to understand the problem that cryptocurrency, specifically Bitcoin, is attempting to solve. To me, this is everything. You may have been told about the wonders of crypto or your friend who got in early and is now retired, but without a deep understanding of the why, you won't have the conviction to hold through the what. But more on that later. When one is just entering the rabbit hole, they ask, well, what is Bitcoin? In a word, Bitcoin is money. But then you ask, well, what is money? And this is where everyone's Bitcoin journey begins with a simple yet profound question. So to summarize, money is time. Money is our best attempt to preserve and transfer time through space. Anyone can exchange their time for money. Contrary to what most people believe and what Benjamin Franklin famously wrote in his 1748 essay, Advice to a Young Tradesman, time is not money. Just ask any 20 year old if they'd want to trade their time for a dying billionaire's wealth. You can't spend a nickel if you run out of time to do it. So similarly to how all squares are rectangles, but not all rectangles are squares, money is time, but time is not money. Money is our way of encapsulating time and in a medium which we can trade with others. This is why we use the verb spend in reference to how we allocate it. So you can think of money as the middle layer between one's time and what they want to trade it for. This necessary intermediary serves to preserve the preciousness of the base layer. It can be said then that humanity's quest to discover money was essentially a desire to bottle time in a way that was both permanent and transferable. One thing to think about and a question for you to ponder is, why do we have a financial system that relies on an ever increasing amount of debt when the asset the debt represents, time, is absolutely finite? So to put it another way, given that money is meant to encapsulate time, doesn't it only make sense that the currency which backs it is the one with the most limited supply and therefore the scarcest, just like time itself? 
Never forget this idea, because so long as you remember that money is time, I'm confident that the more you learn about Bitcoin, the more it will make sense why Bitcoin is the best form of money ever invented, and why it's desperately needed to save us from the time theft that exists in our centralized financial system. It could be said that fiat currency or money that is centrally controlled and backed by government decree is a broken system. When we leave the management of the currency supply to a central agency who can print it at whim without consequence, it leads to the debasement of value for those who save in the currency. Unfortunately, this is most often the poor who live paycheck to paycheck and don't have the means to store wealth in hard assets which appreciate in value over time. This in turn leads to an increase in the wealth gap. Known as the Cantillian effect, the idea is that those who are closest to the money printer benefit the most since they borrow the newly printed money at the best interest rates, because they're the most creditworthy, and they get to buy the assets with the money that is printed out of thin air first. This increases those asset prices, such as stocks and real estate, which then makes it more expensive for the average person who are left paying the higher prices instead of benefiting from them. When prices rise over time due to there being more money competing for the same amount of goods, the poor people are stuck paying the bill. It's been said that inflation is a hidden tax because most don't really understand how it works, but tax doesn't quite do it justice. What's really happening is money, which is again just bottled up time, is being siphoned from the poor and given to the rich or those who are the closest to the newly printed money. If you look throughout history, the forced stealing of time from others is frankly best described as slavery. For just how pervasive the time theft of central banking has been on humanity, I implore you to read Bitcoin philosopher Robert Breedlove's work titled Masters of Slaves and Money. Of course, this theft of human time isn't the only problem with fiat. The excess printing of money has led to many hyperinflations throughout history, most notably in the Weimar Republic in the late 1920s, which is best accounted in the book When Money Dies. But more recently, we've seen this in Zimbabwe and Venezuela. What's important to understand, and the real aha moment for me, was when I realized that we weren't on a different curve than these countries, because we operate under the same exact monetary system as them. We're simply at a different point on the same curve. Some would argue we're not far behind, as here in the US we've printed 40% of all dollars in existence in the past 12 months alone. Most experts believe this trend will continue, which is people worried about our currency holding value. Ray Dalio, arguably the best macro investor of all time, famously said, cash is trash. So once you understand the problems with fiat, you can't unsee them, right? Once one loses faith in the fiat currency, they never regain it. So it's because of this that eventually there will be a run on the bank scenario where the mass collective wakes up and we reach a tipping point where people no longer trust storing their wealth in fiat and look to move into hard assets. Like Hemingway famously observes, this process happens gradually, then suddenly which is subsequently the title of Parker Lewis's most recent series on finance and Bitcoin, who's one of my favorite macro investors. Put simply, our entire financial system can be thought of as a game of musical chairs. Everyone's singing and dancing merrily so long as the music is playing, but you don't want to be the one scrambling for a chair when the music stops. Better early than late, and for this reason, I've spent the last five years searching for chairs. It's important to realize I didn't start by learning about Bitcoin because I have some bias toward it. Instead, I started learning about money and the problems with our centralized system, which ultimately led me down the rabbit hole to Bitcoin. So now that you're aware of the problems of fiat, it's time to examine the properties of money. Once you compare two monies side by side, you can decide for yourself where you'd rather store your wealth. Typically, independent economic participants like you and me, but even corporations and governments, all have a choice over which medium to use for savings. Most commonly, this is one's local currency, or gold. That's all changed in 2009 when Satoshi Nakamoto released Bitcoin into the world, introducing a new, and I'd argue superior, form of money. Before we examine the properties of Bitcoin and what makes it unique, let's first examine what properties lead to a commodity being used as money. Recall that for something to be used as money in a society, it is the consensus of independent market participants, you, me, whoever, converging around one commodity. Since this has happened countless times throughout history, and many items have been used as money, from shells to beads to tobacco and precious metals, we have a long history of the commonalities of these elements, and we can compare them to examine what makes some forms of money better than others. So for something to be considered money, it must possess these seven traits. First, it must be fungible, meaning one unit is interchangeable with another. I can exchange my dollar for your dollar because they're the same. Second, it must be portable. Money must be able to easily move from one place to another. Third, it must be durable. Money must be able to resist wear or decay. Fourth, acceptable. Money must be able to be generally distributed and widely accepted. Fifth, uniform. All versions of the same domination must have the same purchasing power. Sixth, divisible. 
one unit can be broken down into smaller units to pay for a wide range of goods and services. Last, and in fact, the most important, is money must be a store of value. The limited supply of the money in circulation ensures its value is preserved over time. So fiat currency possesses the first six characteristics of money, but it's designed to lose value over time due to inflation, and it's not a store of value, and therefore it cannot be considered money, but rather it is currency. Gold, on the other hand, is a store of value, as its purchasing power has been preserved throughout time for thousands of years, and therefore it can be considered money. So learning to distinguish between money and currency may seem subtle, but it's profound. Neurolinguistic programming, or NLP, is a field of study which examines how words shape our beliefs and are used to literally program how we see the world. So if you can begin to properly identify fiat as currency and gold and Bitcoin as money, then it helps to reinforce the problems with fiat and the benefits of hard money to yourself and to others. The core of my talk and a first principle upon which to build one's assumption about the future is that people will ultimately converge around the best form of money to store their wealth. The reason is due to game theory, a field which, unlike economics and finance, which I had to learn from scratch, I can say I'm an expert in thanks to poker. Game theory is a framework for decision making in which, in situations where competing players are motivated by differing incentives. Pioneered by John von Neumann, game theory was developed as he aimed to solve, of course, the problem of bluffing in poker, a situation in which one has imperfect information, yet still must make a decision. It just so happens that I played poker professionally for more than 15 years, so I've gotten to see the applications of this phenomenon firsthand countless times. When playing poker, my objective is to understand the tendencies of my competition and design a strategy to outplay them. For example, if I discover my opponent bluffs too often, I'll begin calling him down more. What a call! Wow. What a call! What a call! Wow! This approach works against inferior players who have easily exploitable betting patterns. Against top professionals, things aren't so simple. Imagine my thinking opponent begins our match by bluffing 100% of the time. I adjust by calling him more. Upon seeing that I never fold, he'll switch to betting exclusively with premium holdings, at which point I'll readjust by folding more. As this pattern continues, the less time will pass between each subsequent adjustment until we're both changing our game plan hand by hand, and now he's a force to adopt a mixed strategy, betting with both strong and weak hands to avoid being too predictable. The only way for me to counter is by calling with my strong hands and folding my weak ones. So taken to the extreme, if two supercomputers were playing against each other, they would inevitably reach a point where both machines adopt a perfectly balanced strategy, neither bluffing too often nor too little, neither calling or folding too frequently, resulting in neither machine having an edge over the other. Poker players call this a game theory optimal strategy, and top professionals use it when they believe no edge can be gained by exploding the opposition's weakness. In game theory, this is referred to as the Nash Equilibrium. Named after the mathematician John Forbes Nash Jr., the Nash Equilibrium is a solution in non-cooperative games in which each player is assumed to know the equilibrium strategy of the other players, and therefore no player really has anything to gain by changing his own strategy. What I didn't expect in studying game theory was that it would help me to understand money. The logic behind why a poker player uses game theory can also be applied to a society's choice for money. So when it comes to choosing a type of money, game theory teaches us that people are incentivized to choose the option that is both the most efficient and best maintains its value. Failure to store value in the hardest money will result in losing one's wealth as the inferior money gets replaced by a better one. Inevitably, the most efficient money will win in the long run, just as the player utilizing the best poker strategy inevitably pulls ahead over a large enough sample size. We can illustrate this phenomenon with a simple thought experiment. Imagine the members of a tribe are debating whether to use gold or aluminum and which would serve as a better form of money. They can't agree, so they use both with an exchange rate of one to one. It's obvious how this plays out. The aluminum corrodes and they eventually end up using gold. This eventually played out on a global scale as countries around the world converged on gold as money. Known as la belle époque, the entire world was on a gold standard in the early 1900s. Failure to adopt the hardest money has historically led to economic calamity. In 15th century West Africa, glass beads functioned as money as they were very hard for locals to produce. Meanwhile, the Europeans utilized the gold standard and superior technology in Venice made glass relatively easy to manufacture. Seeing the opportunity, savvy entrepreneurs seeking currency arbitrage filled boats with beads, sailed south, and bought things for pennies on the pound, or more specifically, glass on their gold. This brought such destruction to the wealth of Africa that their currency became known as slave beads, as the debasement of the supply of glass beads literally enslaved the Africans at the hands of the Venetians. In short, the Venetians' use of gold as money allowed them to siphon wealth from Africa, whose currency could easily be manipulated. 
brought to their knees with an inferior soft money, these Africans are ultimately forced to adopt the gold standard. As world-renowned economist Safety and Amos observes in his notable work, The Bitcoin Standard, history shows it's not possible to insulate yourself from the consequences of others holding money that is harder than yours. To borrow a term from poker, gold has historically been the game theory optimal choice for money because no other option has yet proven itself to better satisfy the criteria of money. One of the key things we're taught when we learn from investment is that past performance doesn't guarantee future results. So the question remains, if a better form of money were discovered, would society ultimately converge around it as the world's store of wealth? Well, using first principles we outlined here, the best form of money ultimately wins, and money tends to one, meaning society converges upon one medium as money, the one which best preserves the base layer of time which it represents, so then it's only fair to reason that if a better form of money were discovered, game theory would incentivize people to store their wealth there and ultimately lead to society using this harder form of money. So I present to you, Bitcoin. Placed upon a side-by-side -side comparison, Bitcoin best satisfies the properties of money, outshining even gold. While we don't have time to go into all seven characteristics, two that I would like to highlight are divisibility and, of course, scarcity. So Bitcoin solves the problems of gold, which is why silver was actually used instead, is that it's actually extremely divisible. One Bitcoin can be divided into 100 million units called Satoshis. This limit can even be broken down further if necessary, making Bitcoin the most divisible money in history. But most notably, Bitcoin shines in that it's scarce, the closest thing we must have to mimic time itself. Bitcoin has a fixed supply of 21 million. No more Bitcoin will ever be issued, and it has a predictable and fixed inflation schedule, which will issue new Bitcoins until the year 2140. While we don't have time to get into why this is the case, I encourage you to go deeper down the rabbit hole to better understand Bitcoin's security and why this fixed supply cannot be altered. The point I want to drive home is that Bitcoin is the most efficient form of money, and I believe it will lead to globally be adopted as the universal store of value. The reason it's so volatile now is that it's a new technology which is subject to market and price discovery. The market is not only tradable 24-7, but as people go down the rabbit hole and learn about the problems with fiat, they slowly wake up to what is going on and decide to store the wealth in Bitcoin. This has led Bitcoin to being the best performing asset of the past decade. Volatility means opportunity. When Bitcoin's price is no longer volatile, it means it's achieved its mission of becoming the global store of value, at which point it will be the unit of account and merely a savings technology for people worldwide. As the price increases due to people waking up and choosing to store their wealth in harder money and opt out of the madness that's fiat, some people decide to consume things with their newly appreciated savings and let's say buy a house, for example. This leads to sell off in Bitcoin in exchange for real world goods and services, which causes a drop in price. We talked about Bitcoin being the best form of money, and I really do believe that. But Bitcoin's evolution to money isn't something that's gonna happen overnight. It's the result of society ultimately converging on Bitcoin as the best store of value. This requires people to become educated on things we frankly don't learn in school, such as the problems with fiat or why forms of money are better than others, and of course, the lost field of Austrian economics, which should really just be called economics, but that's a debate for another talk. Money has historically evolved over three phases. First is the store of value, then it's a medium of exchange, and finally it's a unit of account. Bitcoin is relatively new, and it's in the store of value phase. Although it's widely debated as to how long the timeline this will take to unfold, one thing is clear. It will take some time. This time, I believe, is a window of opportunity. I wish we had more time to discuss other important topics as to how Bitcoin operates, why I believe it can't be copied nor disrupted by another crypto, why it can't be banned, and why it doesn't really consume too much energy. But I'll, for that, I'll have to point you to some resources at the end of this talk. For now, I'd like to address something which I know is on everyone's mind, and that is what is the value of Bitcoin and how does this transition actually play out? Depending on the day, the current market of Bitcoin is about a trillion dollars. This is one tenth of the market cap of gold, which is sitting at 10 trillion. But remember, Bitcoin is a far better form of money than gold, so if one believes that efficiency will win, we have an easy 10x from here. But I believe we're just getting started, and in fact, we're living through the greatest wealth transfer in history. We're living through the death of an asset class, where global bonds are paying negative yields. There's some $30 trillion that's going to eventually be looking for a new home when investors finally wake up and smell the coffee. The boomer generation will hold gold and not Bitcoin. People in their 40s may hold some of both, but the millennials and beyond will only hold Bitcoin and not gold. So this means in the span of a few generations, as the richest generation in history transfers their wealth to the millennials and beyond, we'll see incredible inflows of capital into Bitcoin and the greatest wealth transfer the world has ever seen, much of that, of course, which goes into crypto. But it really doesn't stop there. Remember that money evolves over three phases, ending with a unit of account. 
This means that if Bitcoin is to become globally adopted as money, all prices are going to be denominated in it. So here in America, we currently use the US dollar to denominate transactions and value, but this is inefficient because we don't know the current supply nor even the future supply. In a Bitcoin economy, we can simply say that the value of a Bitcoin will be the entire economy divided by the 21 million Bitcoins that exist. It sounds radical and far off, but here's a simple thought experiment to ponder. Imagine an economy with two people, Alice and Bob. Alice fishes and Bob catches squirrels. Each of them have one Bitcoin. Alice now builds a net to catch more fish and can therefore catch fish more efficiently than Bob can catch squirrels, thereby whittling away his Bitcoin. Bob adapts by using a spear. These two items, the net and the spear, are called capital goods. They exist within the economy, but remember, there are still only two Bitcoin. Therefore, the value of the Bitcoin is essentially everything that exists within the economy. But it doesn't end there. It's also the value of everything that will exist in the economy in the future. So ultimately, I imagine a world where most of the wealth is stored in Bitcoin, as people can defer their consumption of present goods and rest assured they will preserve their future purchasing power. When they desire something, they'll just sell Bitcoin for the good or the service. At this time, we'll have quite a stable price of Bitcoin as volatility will come down as the market cap increases and more people store their wealth in it. A fiat world where our currency loses value, purchasing power every year, incentivizes people to speculate on assets which will outpace inflation, most notably real estate and equities in the stock market. This has led to huge bubbles in both assets, which I believe will soften in the future as Bitcoin takes a large share of this pie. Stocks will trade at more reasonable multiples, and on a hard money standard like Bitcoin, people won't need to speculate to outpace inflation. Most don't want to take on additional risk and simply want to bottle their time and spend it later. The luxury that's possible in a Bitcoin economy where those with a lower time preference and a more future-oriented decision-making process are rewarded by simply deferring consumption. On a Bitcoin standard, one's purchasing power increases over time since technology brings down the price of goods and it also increases their quality and therefore one is incentivized to defer consumption today to buy something better tomorrow. This is just the beginning of the very, very deep rabbit hole that is not just Bitcoin, but value, economics, finance, history, psychology, and game theory. I encourage you to explore it further because I personally believe it's the most captivating thing happening in this society today. These predictions may sound far off, impossible even, so let me leave you with a framework for which you can use to come up to your own conclusions. For one to conclude that Bitcoin will eventually become a global reserve currency and the ultimate store of value for savers worldwide, they really only have to believe two things. First, they must conclude that Bitcoin is in fact the best form of money. We discussed this briefly, but I encourage you to do your own research and verify this for yourself. You can start by reading or watching my series, The Future of Money, or reading The Bitcoin Standard, uh, as I mentioned, or if you're more financially savvy, Gradually Than Suddenly by Parker Lewis. Second, one must believe that efficiency always wins in the end. While I believe this first principle applies to many facets of life, in the case of Bitcoin, it means that society will ultimately converge on the best form of money to store their value. Remember, our fiat system can be thought of as one big game of musical chairs. And right now the music's playing loud and we're printing money and only feeling subtle effects of inflation. So right now many are dancing uh, as their hard assets are appreciating in dollar terms. But also remember that Bitcoin is the ultimate unit of account. And since its invention just over a decade ago, the dollar has gotten crushed in Bitcoin terms. One thing you can begin to do as you enter the rabbit hole is begin denominating your wealth in Bitcoin. As the popular meme goes in the crypto community, one Bitcoin is equal to one Bitcoin. Finally, it's been said that the further you look into the past, the further you can see into the future. Every single instance of fiat currency has ultimate fail, ultimately failed given a long enough time horizon. As Voltaire says, fiat always returns to its intrinsic value, zero. So I'd encourage you to look for your chair while the music is still playing because you don't want to be scrambling when it stops. I'm Alec Torelli. Thanks for your attention. I'll see you in the next one.